Hello and welcome everyone. My name is Debbie Leone and I am the Information Services Manager for the Epilepsy Foundation of Minnesota. On behalf of EFMN, I'd like to thank you for joining us for our Wellness Wednesday webinar. Our topic tonight is Psychogenic Non-Epileptic Seizures or PNES. We are grateful to be partnering tonight with Dr. Julia Doss of Doss Clinic of Health Psychology to discuss this often misunderstood topic. Um, while EFMN is hosting this webinar, all content and discussion points are led and delivered by our guest speaker. The information shared is to inform you about various aspects of PNES. However, specific concerns about your loved one, your or your loved one's diagnosis or treatment should be discussed directly with your medical provider. The Epilepsy Foundation of Minnesota offers a range of programs and services that provide support, connection, and education to those who are impacted by epilepsy. And I'd like to talk about just a few of these. Um, many of you may be familiar with our summer camp programs, which include Camp Oz, that's our one week overnight traditional camp experience. Our day camp, which is for, it helps to prepare youth for attending overnight camp and family camp for those with additional physical, social, or emotional needs. Our virtual connect groups are a monthly space to meet others on a similar epilepsy journey to share experiences and peer support. Connect groups are offered for a number of different audiences, including adults with epilepsy, parents and caregivers of children with epilepsy, young adults, teens, and those with a rare or complex diagnosis, as well as a quarterly connect group for those who've lost a loved one to epilepsy. We also offer occasional customized connect groups for specific audiences as those needs are identified. Our education services offer seizure smart trainings for schools, workplaces, social service organizations, healthcare facilities, and more, as well as these live webinars. Information services provides individuals, caregivers, and professionals with information and referrals on a wide variety of epilepsy-related topics through free one-to-one -one customized support. And our Shining Star program is for all youth with epilepsy under the age of 18 and includes opportunities for youth to connect, support resources for families, and epilepsy awareness opportunities for families and communities. We know that epilepsy can feel isolating, so we offer social events that seek to bring together all types of people affected by epilepsy to connect, to share experiences, and to have fun. These events happen throughout the year, and they vary by region of the state to meet local needs. Our advocacy efforts aim to shape policy at the local and state levels with the goal of making Minnesota a better place for those living with epilepsy. And finally, our donated goods operation plays a key role in serving the epilepsy community in Minnesota. Donations of clothing and household items help EFMN to fund our programs and services. And information about where we offer free pickup services or drop-off bins is available on the EFMN website. We have a number of great events that are coming up soon. Um, due to the holidays, we are focusing a lot on events in December, uh, but we do have one connect group happening. And this is one of those customized groups I just mentioned. And this is for folks who are parenting while living with epilepsy. So our Parents with Epilepsy Connect Group will be meeting on December 13th. We have four different season of giving events that have um, sort of a, a charitable give back um, focus, um, each with a slightly different activity. And those will be happening in Austin on December 5th and in Minnetonka and Rochester on December 10th, as well as in Marshall on December 15th. And then we finally will wrap up the month of December with a virtual winter break bingo event. So we hope everybody will join us and play some bingo and win some prizes. Uh, but we do really hope that um, you'll join us for one or more of these events. And if you want details and links to register, those can be found on our website calendar at, at epilepsyfoundationmn.org slash events. So a few housekeeping items here. Uh, the webinar will last an hour and 40, an hour and 15 minutes, so we will be done at 745. 
In order to have the best webinar experience, we encourage you to close out any windows you may have open on your devices that use a lot of bandwidth, especially things like streaming services or music applications. We will be providing a certificate of attendance that will be sent out via email within three business days. And I'm also going to send a copy of our speaker's PowerPoint slides so you'll be able to refer back to them and you won't have to take maybe quite so many notes tonight. Um, the webinar is also being recorded and we will be posting that on the EFMM website for future viewing. You will also notice that we have closed captioning activated. If you don't wish to see those captions, you can click on the CC icon at the bottom of your screen, and there you can choose to hide those subtitles. We do encourage you to ask questions. Whoops, went one slide too far. Um, yes, we encourage you to ask questions during the webinar, and you can do that by clicking on the Q&A icon, which you should see at the bottom of your screen. That will bring up a text box where you can type your question and then hit send. We are going to allow time at the end of the webinar for our speaker to answer as many of your questions as possible. We do encourage you to type your questions in as you're thinking of them. Don't wait until the end. Sometimes there's a mad rush at the end, and we want to make sure that we have time to get to as many of your questions as possible. Our speaker will not be able to offer medical opinions about your symptoms or your loved one's symptoms, diagnosis, or treatment. So for that reason, and to respect everyone's privacy, please keep your questions general in nature and not specific to any one individual. You can also use that Q&A box to let us know about any technical problems you might be having during the webinar. My EFMN colleague, Kenzie Mabron, is here with us off camera uh, to help with those types of issues. And to avoid confusion, the chat feature has been disabled. So I want to look now at our objectives for this webinar. One is to define what P PNES is and how it differs from epileptic seizures to understand the impact PNES has on the individual's daily life, to learn how PNES is diagnosed, and to explore treatment options and how to find a provider. I am very excited to introduce you to our speaker for this evening. Julia Doss is a pediatric psychologist and founder of Doss Clinic of Health Psychology. She is a consultant for Children's Hospitals and Clinics of Minnesota. She's been doing that for the past 15 years. Her clinical and research focus has been devoted to working with children with epilepsy, their comorbid emotional and behavioral disorders, and to patients with psychogenic non-epileptic seizures. Diagnosis, treatment, and research of non-epileptic seizures is her specialization. Since 2008, Dr. Doss has presented annually at the American Epilepsy Society. She has six peer-reviewed papers and four chapters, and she is the co-author of a book on the treatment of PNES in children. We are honored to have her here with us tonight, and with that, I will now turn things over to Dr. Doss. Thank you, and welcome, everybody. Um, I hope tonight that I can go through um, a comprehensive overview of what PNES is and um, help to explain a bit about diagnosis, ways to find treatment providers, and give a couple of tips on um, being able to get started back into, you know, everyday life after the diagnosis happens. I am going to save some time at the end for questions, um, like Debbie mentioned. So please feel free to type those in as we go. I'm not going to stop in the middle of the presentation to answer those. I'll answer those all at the end. Some of what I might cover, you know, or some of the questions you might have, I might cover later on in the talk. So um, I look forward to this being an informative um, talk for all of you. Um, next slide, please. There we go. Um, so we need to define it first. Um, psychogenic non-epileptic seizures involve alteration in behavior, consciousness, sensation, and um, they resemble epileptic seizures very closely sometimes. Um, prior to having my private practice, I worked on the epilepsy unit at Children's Hospital in St. Paul for 14 years. And looking at a person having a non-epileptic seizure 
and seeing a person with an epileptic seizure next, you know, side by side, you wouldn't necessarily be able to tell the difference. What really needs to happen is to have an EEG so that a person can see what's going on in the brain during the episode that's in question. So non-epileptic seizures, psychogenic non-epileptic seizures are not associated with abnormal brain activity. So when the person is getting that EEG, the doctors can see, is there abnormal brain activity happening? And if that's the case, then it's often an epileptic seizure. If that is not the case, then more often than not, it is a non-epileptic episode. Um, often there's been a lot of change over the years in how this has been defined. And I'll explain that a little bit in some of the next slides, but there are often psychological stressors associated with the onset of these symptoms. I'll explain that in a little bit more detail as we go, because that can be a little bit confusing for families um, when these symptoms start. They can seem to come completely out of the blue. Um, often the person is doing normal things and an episode starts. So linking it to some type of stressor um, is often really confusing at the beginning. And I can kind of explain that in a little bit more detail. Non-epileptic seizures are technically classified as a conversion disorder in the diagnostic manual for psychiatric conditions. The term conversion disorder is one that has been kind of in place for a number of years. And I like that term for a couple of reasons. It's, it essentially means that a person is taking something stressful and stress can be a, a, from a number of different things. It can be from physical things like medical issues. It can be from psychological things like anxiety or depression. And it can be from everyday life things that are sort of piling up over time. So there's a number of different things that fall under that umbrella of stressors. But essentially what happens is the person's body takes that stressor and converts it into a physical symptom and it expresses itself, at least in this case, like a seizure. That's how that term conversion disorder came about. And that's why it's labeled that way in our diagnostic manual. Next slide, please. So I think it's, I always think it's really important to kind of understand where this came from, like in any diagnosis or in any history of any disorder, it's important to know um, where it started, when it was first recognized, and kind of how it's been researched and understood over time. With psychogenic non-epileptic seizures, they were first labeled as hysterical disorders, which I'm going to get into in a minute. So you might see in old um, research articles, or if you're, if you're looking online even, that these um, symptoms are labeled as hysteria. Sometimes they're even called hysterical seizures. One of the more common terms that was in place for a number of years, probably 50, 60 years, was called pseudo seizures. More recently, um, in the 90, 1990s until kind of present, it was recognized that the term pseudo seizure is a pretty negative sounding term, pseudo meaning fake, and then seizure. So what's been recognized in the medical community is that these seizures, these are not fake. They are not epileptic in nature, but they still involve some pretty difficult and challenging processes that the person is experiencing that are both physiological and emotional. And so the terminology has shifted from, from you know, the early 1990s until now to trying to develop a better term for this. Psychogenic non-epileptic seizures is the term that I tend to use. And part of that is because that's where in a lot of the research over the last 30, 40 years, that's the term that's been used. And that's how I came up in the world using that term. More recently, like within the last five, 10 years, the term functional seizures has started to be um, more common. And um, it's not yet been replacing non-epileptic, the psychogenic non-epileptic seizure term, but it might. So it's important for everyone out there to know that there's a lot of different terms out there. You can type things into Google and it'll bring up a lot of different stuff. Some of that's accurate, some of it's not, but these are the different terms that you might you might look up online if you were trying to understand the disorder a bit more. Okay, next slide, please. 
So again, looking back at history, there are accounts of what was later labeled as hysteria dating all the way back to ancient Egyptian time um, in ancient Egyptian hieroglyphs. Um, as time progressed and kind of in the Middle Ages, there were more, um, there was more research into all different disorders, including epilepsy. And it was thought for a long time that any type of physical shaking of the body was caused by supernatural forces or even demon possession. Plato and Aristotle were two philosophers that actually started to think a little differently about things and researched the human body and looked at um, the way the body moves and how the body shakes during a seizure, that it can look different and be different for different people. And that was the, that was the first time that hysteria was kind of thought of as being a possible cause of the disorder. Now, hysteria um, comes from the Greek word hystera, which is um, the word for the uterus. So for many, many years, people thought that non-epileptic seizures were a disorder of women in particular, because women have uteruses. And according to these ancient philosophers, the um, uterus would detach itself, move around the body and cause, cause all kinds of problems. And that's why they thought non-epileptic seizures happened. Of course, now we understand that that's ridiculous and that isn't how it happens, but there is still a tendency to believe that this is a disorder mainly of women. Um, next slide, please. Until much more recently, um, in the late 1800s actually, Charcot, who was a French physician, started to study the disorder more thoroughly and recognize that non-epileptic seizures were not only a disorder of women, um, they do tend to happen more in women, um, which I'll get to later, but they, it's not only a disorder of women. And it was thought at that time and kind of now that this disorder is again linked to stressors. Um, uh, Sigmund Freud, who was um, probably most of you have heard of him, he was uh, kind of the founder of psychiatry, was a student of Charcot's. And he was the one who really took a lot of interest in this area and was one of the first physicians to actually study PNES. Next slide, please. What we now understand today in today's time is that non-epileptic seizures fall under a, a even broader category than conversion disorder called functional neurological disorder. And there are functional syndromes in kind of every body system, essentially. So in neurology, we see non-epileptic events, tension headaches. In gastroenterology, there's pain and irritable bowel, gynecology, et cetera, as you can see all these different functional syndromes that um, physicians have come to understand occur. So when a person experiences stressors, they don't, and they have symptoms that are physical, they don't only show up as non-epileptic seizures. Sometimes people have abdominal pain. Sometimes people have rheumatology disorders that look like they're medical, but they're actually conversion re related. Um, same with cardiology. So our talk today is gonna focus really specifically on non-epileptic seizures, but just understand that there are a lot of other physical symptoms that the body can show that can also be conversion disorder. And they develop for the same reasons as non-epileptic seizures do. Um, and they actually can be treated in the same way that non-epileptic seizures can be treated. So it's also important to recognize that these functional syndromes like PNES are more common than people think. You often don't hear about them um, out in the world because if you see a person having a seizure, you automatically would assume that it would probably be an epileptic seizure. But non-epileptic seizures are actually much more common than people realize. So um, next slide, please. So we're gonna get into now um, assessment and diagnosis. I'm gonna go over what is considered in the PNES world as the gold standard of assessment um, so that everybody understands the best way to kind of approach an appropriate diagnosis. Um, but there are a lot of ways that people do end up getting diagnosed. And I can answer some of those questions at the end if people have questions about um, Diag diagnostic processes and things like that. Next slide, please. So how common is PNES? 
within the medical community, it's recognized that there are a number of people who show up into the ER that have and are having a seizure that a certain percentage of those folks are actually having a non-epileptic seizure. When you kind of go to a more comprehensive epilepsy center where they, that's kind of what they do every single day, about 20% of the people referred to a comprehensive epilepsy center have non-epileptic seizures. So what I always used to say was when I worked on the neurology unit, we had 10 to 12 beds on that unit. At any given time, at least two of the beds of people that were there getting evaluated were young people that had non-epileptic seizures. And sometimes it was even more than that. Sometimes it was three to four. Um, within people who have non-epileptic seizures, one in six of those people will have had a history of epilepsy. So the way that I think about it is that like, there are a, a portion of people that have the non-epileptic seizures and a percentage of those people have also had a history of epilepsy. That doesn't mean that they happen at the same time, that they have epileptic and non-epileptic at the same time, although that does also happen. Um, it could be that they've had a history of epilepsy, they were treated and did not have any more epileptic seizures and then later in life had non-epileptic. So it can happen in a variety of different ways, but that is something that we see and it is one of the risk factors that we see. Um, non-epileptic seizures are more common in adolescents and in young adults than they are in early childhood or later adulthood, although it can develop at any time. Um, and it is three times more common in females. This is true, especially of later adolescent into young adulthood. That's where we see about 75% of the people that come in and are diagnosed are women. Now, the younger you get, uh, the more even the numbers are between male and female who develop the disorder. There are a number of reasons why it's thought that women tend to be more likely to have non-epileptic seizures than men. Um, one of them is hormonal. There's the question of hormonal um, influence. The other piece of it is that at least historically, non-epileptic seizures were thought to be due to trauma. And trauma is much more common in women than it is in men, um, especially sexual trauma. So for a number of years, it was thought that non-epileptic seizures were a disorder of people who had been traumatized. We understand now that that is not necessarily the case. It is a risk factor, but it is not necessarily the primary one. Um, but that is one of the reasons that we tend to see that a little bit more often in women than we do in men at you know, later adolescent, early adulthood. Uh, next slide, please. So a person is experiencing what looks like a seizure. The gold standard, meaning like the best way you can diagnose this is to go to a neurologist and have an, a video EEG. Um, video EEG is, you can kind of see the picture off to the right there. Um, a person will go and get leads put all over their head that are linked to a computer. And the physician will be able to watch the person's brain over time to determine if there are any abnormal electrical events happening when a person is experiencing one of their typical episodes. Now, it's hard sometimes to capture one of those typical episodes on EEG, but that is the gold standard to be able to diagnose this appropriately. Um, again, back to the beginning, I was explaining that the physician will watch the EEG while the person is having the episode and be able to tell if the movement in the body um, and the way the brain is behaving line up with an epileptic seizure, what they, what they see with epileptic seizures or what they see with non-epileptic episodes. And so um, that gold standard video EG is very important. Um, it's also important just because a person has that episode on EEG and they don't see any abnormal electrical activity happening there is a possibility that there might be other physiological things causing it. So typically what physicians will do is they will also look at, is there any heart related thing that we should be concerned about? Are there any, is, they will sometimes check blood work to make sure that there's not, no concern for something like diabetes. 
And that will help them to determine that it is then a non-epileptic episode. Um, I have on this slide too that mental health providers should be involved in the diagnosis and treatment. This is actually a very rare event uh, in a neurology uh, clinic. There are not a lot of mental health providers that work in clinics um, around the entire country actually. But if, that, if there are people available, a social worker, a psychologist, or another type of a counselor who can help to evaluate, that's often one of the most helpful ways to get the person into treatment, into appropriate treatment, which we'll get into in a few minutes. Uh, next slide, please. So when meeting with the physician, I often will, if, if I'm meeting with a person before they have had an opportunity to go to the neurologist, I often will encourage them to make sure that they go with a list of questions. They need to have the diagnosis clarified. They need to understand what a full neurological evaluation looks like and how they how the physician is able to tell this is a non-epileptic episode because it's so important for people that are getting this diagnosis to really understand how that diagnosis was made. For the physician's role, it is also really helpful if the physician can stay involved with the patient after the diagnosis is made. Um, sometimes that happens and sometimes it doesn't, but it is really helpful because often when a person has experienced these episodes and then they get this diagnosis, they're going to have medical questions over time. And so if the physician can stay involved at least you know, intermittently until the person is in treatment to get those uh, questions, those medical questions answered, that's really helpful. They also are really important in the, in the delivery of the diagnosis. The physician is often like that frontline person. So if they are able to both explain the diagnosis and then help the person to kind of point in the direction of treatment, um, at least in my experience, that's been the best uh, case scenario for people getting into the appropriate treatment and not needing to go and have other evaluations. Sometimes, because there is still a diagnostic delay, meaning when people develop these symptoms in the United States, there's still over, um, the average is over a year delay between the onset of symptoms and appropriate diagnosis. So what often happens for those folks is that they have these symptoms, they might go to the ER or they go to a neurologist. Um, they might even get diagnosed with epilepsy at first, get put on medication, and then the medicine isn't working. And so then they go and they end up having a more thorough evaluation after that. And then they learn, oh, this is actually non-epileptic. That's a really common pathway to get to this diagnosis for both young people and for adults. And um, when that happens, a lot of people are taking medication for seizures, for epilepsy. What we know about non-epileptic seizures is that epileptic medication pe for people that have epileptic seizures does not work with non-epileptic seizures um, because those abnormal brain, uh, that abnormal brain activity isn't happening and that's what that medication targets. So when a physician then makes that diagnosis of non-epileptic seizures, but the person is on medicine for epilepsy, often that medicine has to be tapered off or will be tapered off slowly if they don't also have epileptic seizures. So the physician staying involved for that is also really important. Uh, next slide, please. When there is a counselor of some type in, in, that is involved in the neurology clinic and they are able to participate, it's helpful if they interview the parent and child if it's a young person or if it's an older person and adult, then interview, the, um, interview that individual patient, obviously and then to create a framework for understanding conversion disorder. Now, often there are not psychologists and there are also not sometimes even social workers available in those clinics or in the hospital to help to explain this diagnosis. So when a person goes to an outpatient therapist to get treatment, that is where this evaluation happens. And in, in that situation, it's really important for um, the therapist to get as much information as possible about the medical evaluation as well as the symptoms. 
So for all of you out in the audience who either have non-epileptic seizures or who have a loved one who has it, critically important for that therapist that you might meet with to have a really, really thorough understanding of what the symptoms are when they happen, um, kind of as much detail as you can get. Often when I meet people for the first time and I'm working with them, I might spend the entire first session talking about the medical evaluation and um, what the symptoms are and how they're impacting like everyday life. Uh, because the way the symptoms happen in everyday life is the first place we start when we're trying to target treatment. Um, next slide, please. So I have this slide in here partly because once um, when people are diagnosed with non-epileptic seizures, there's a range of things that happen. Um, unfortunately, a lot of people don't have a very good experience of being diagnosed. Um, and I think that's, I think that's really, really unfortunate because it prevents people from getting the help they need faster. Um, and one of the reasons that they have that negative experience is related to these myths that you see here on the screen. Now these myths or biases or whatever you want to call them are things that people run into um, from medical providers sometimes that the provider has these myth, these biases or the myths. Um, sometimes people who are getting diagnosed feel some of these ways or they wonder about some of this stuff or they look online and they see some of this stuff online, which, you know, like many things online, there's a lot of stuff that's not accurate out there. So, um, and I'll give you later um, some good websites to go to so you guys can learn some more information if you need to that are really good websites that have a lot of really accurate information. But the, I'm gonna go through each of these myths because I think it's important to just address them and put them to rest. Um, often it's thought that when a person is experiencing these symptoms that the stressors, like we talked about before those piles of stressors, whatever those are that have caused this are really easy to identify. It's actually my experience that a lot of people don't know what caused this when it first starts. Um, the symptoms are so physical. Most of the time people believe it's a medical condition or, you know, epilepsy, understandably, because the symptoms are very physical. And they often also don't occur at the time of a stressor. So they might, person might be watching a movie, hanging out with their best friend, eating lunch, you know, something really normal, something very like not terribly stressful. And all of a sudden a symptom will happen. Um, and so that is why that connection between stressors and these episodes is really confusing. And there can be a bias that, oh, there must have been some huge thing that happened. And that's why these episodes started. That often isn't the case. Uh, that hasn't been the case for a lot of the people that I've worked with. Um, second point, um, PNES is always caused by trauma. I have brought this up earlier that um, trauma is a risk factor. And it is definitely a risk factor for um, people who develop this when they're a little bit older, meaning outside of the teen years, once they're in their early 20s or a little bit later. Um, trauma is more of a risk factor then. But if you look at people under the age of 18, trauma is a, a risk factor, but not one of the main ones. Uh, bullying, loss, um, which could be death, uh, divorce, loss of a friend, um, really things that they identify as significant loss, um, and school-related struggles are the three primary things that we see in youth who develop this. Um, another myth is that um, people who present with this have really easily identifiable psychiatric issues like anxiety or depression. Now, a lot of people who develop this do have histories of anxiety or depression, or they have at that time of diagnosis also, they're also experiencing anxiety or depression. But the it's not always really obvious to them. Sometimes they've had that diagnosis and been treated for it before. Other times they don't even recognize that they have those symptoms of depression or anxiety. And then when they meet with a therapist and start going through history, it's more obvious that that is something that's happening. Um, one of the things that a lot of patients will come to me with when we first meet is the feeling that they've been told either 
by someone in the medical community or when they were getting diagnosed that they are faking their symptoms or that these symptoms are for attention or that they can somehow magically control these symptoms so they're making it happen at certain times. N none of that is accurate at all. Um, over time and through treatment, people learn how to control the symptoms. But at the onset of these, that is not something that people just automatically know how to do. Um, and the symptoms certainly are not fake um, in any shape or form. So um, these are some of the myths that people run into when they're first diagnosed. And hopefully I'm putting some of that to rest because none, none of this is, is accurate. Uh, next slide, please. Um, I put this slide up here because I think it's really important to recognize that um, not getting diagnosed quickly uh, with PNES, when that is what the diagnosis is, can be very costly from both um, a financial standpoint with lots and lots of evaluations, going to the emergency room, ambulance rides, et cetera. But it also has a lot of personal cost for the patient and for the family. Um, lost time at work, um, if it's a child, lost time at school, um, social difficulties. It, if there are emotional things going on like anxiety or depression, it can make those things worse. Um, and it's just very taxing on everyone involved. Um, and so the overall cost of, non, of not having this diagnosed quickly is very high. Um, we've seen people getting diagnosed more quickly in the last 10 years than pr prior to that, which is great. Um, because there's more access to uh, neurologists and video EEG equipment and things like that. But um, it's still well over a year for a lot of people um, to get to appropriate diagnosis. Uh, next slide, please. So now we're going to get into some practical stuff. What do you do after you have the diagnosis or someone you love has the diagnosis? Next slide, please. So um, I'm going to go through some sort of tips related to therapy. Um, often when people are diagnosed with this, uh, the physicians will say, okay, good. We know what this is. You don't need to be on medication for it. Um, not epileptic medication anyway. Um, you can start working with somebody in therapy. Um, that can be confusing to folks. So I'm going to go through that in more detail. Um, I think of this in stages. When the diagnosis first happens, it's important stage one is managing the symptoms so that the person can kind of return to life. The second stage is understanding why the symptoms happened in the first place. And then the third stage, which is a little bit deeper, takes a little bit longer to get to, is changing patterns of coping. Because if, these, if we think of these as being caused by stressors, then the body is using these episodes as a way of coping with those stressors. It's an expression of those stressors. Um, what we need to do is teach the body to do something different. And so that can take a little bit of time, um, but that is the typical treatment path. Next slide, please. Often when you um, hear about going to therapy, uh, physicians or other therapists will recommend these types of therapies. So you might've heard of cognitive behavioral therapy or exposure or mindfulness therapy, behavior modification. Any of these therapies can be used with both young people and adults with this diagnosis. And often the therapists that I know, including myself who treat people with non-epileptic seizures use a combination of all of these things together. Um, people who develop this disorder are very different from one another. The reasons they develop the symptoms are very different. Um, and so there isn't a cookie cutter way to approach this. Um, so when you are out there looking for a therapist, these are some of the buzzwords you might see. Um, a person might list themselves as a cognitive behavior person or a behavior modification person. Any of those are okay in terms of um, types of therapy to use with this. Um, it's most important that the person you're going to or that you might see has some idea of what non-epileptic seizures are and has at least heard of it before and might have a sense of how to start approaching it. That's more important actually than the type, than this like specific type of therapy. Uh, next slide, please. 
typically, and I'm just going to go through kind of some of what I do and what some of my colleagues do who work with this quite often, we will start with reducing the severity and frequency of the physical symptoms first. Um, as long as those physical symptoms are going on, it's very hard to do anything else. Um, they take over, they interfere with work, they interfere with school, uh, they're really disruptive, they can be embarrassing for people depending on what the, what the symptom is. And so focusing in on the symptoms first and helping the person learn ways um, and different behavioral techniques for managing those symptoms is often where a lot of us will start. And then right alongside that, we try to start encouraging returning to normal functioning as much as possible. Um, and this will often involve like problem solving obstacles to being able to function with these symptoms. So it's not, I'm going to I'm gonna to wait to go back to school until these symptoms are totally gone. It's how can I get myself back into school slowly while I try to treat these symptoms at the same time? And what can that look like? Next slide, please. This is an example of um, what a cognitive behavioral process, thought process would be with these symptoms. And this is why cognitive behavior, behavioral therapy is often one of the most recommended for this disorder. Um, so an example, um, the person has a non-epileptic seizure and they, their belief is uh, every time I'm really active, like I go to gym or I go out of the house to go to work, my symptoms get worse then you go up to the little emotions part and it's, that makes me sad, that makes me anxious, that makes me scared that this is gonna keep happening. And then you go down to the little behavior part and your behavior changes and you decide, I am no longer going to gym. I am not gonna go to work right now until these symptoms are better. And then that reinforces the belief that I shouldn't go to work, I shouldn't go to gym because that makes the symptoms worse. And as you can see, it's this little cycle, this little triangle cycle. When we're working in therapy, one of the things we try to do is figure out how to interrupt somewhere in there. One of those little pathways, we try to get in the middle of it and figure out a different pathway so that um, you can start, and the person with the non-epileptic seizures can start learning how to function again in a little bit more of a typical way for them. Next slide, please. So I, I know I'm sort of, uh, reinforcing over and over the return to normal. The reason that this is so important, this is actually probably one of the most, in my opinion, one of the most important parts of treatment, any type of treatment for this. Um, two reasons, doing normal things makes people feel better. And so if you are not able to do those normal things, you are naturally gonna get more anxious and depressed. So that's gonna to add to those stressors that are causing these symptoms. The other part of it is that these symptoms have a tendency to respond a lot to that return to normal. In my work with young people who have this, if they are able to start doing like their sport again, or they're able to go to a class at school, or they're able to have lunch with their friends. One of the things that we see is that they become more aware of their body they sort of recognize like, hmm, I feel weird right now. My symptoms, I might, I might have an episode right now. My symptoms might get started now. They are able to tune in more quickly to their body, which is a key in treatment. And we're able to get to different interventions more quickly because they, they have more awareness of their body. If they end up being in a really safe space and they're at home all the time, or they're kind of like, in a little bubble waiting for these symptoms to go away. Sometimes we're able to get those symptoms to get better, but as soon as they step outside of that bubble, the symptoms come back. And sometimes they come back even bigger because it's like, I don't feel safe going out of my bubble anymore. So as hard as it is to get back to normal, one of the things that we need to do is figure out how do we manage the symptoms in a safe way and help the person to figure out how to like slowly wind their way back into normal activity. Um, next slide, please. One of the things that can be the most challenging is finding a therapist who can help. Um, there are not a lot of us in the country that really specialize in this. Um, and part of the reason for that is because 
in order to work in this area, you have to go to additional trainings, like multiple additional trainings in order to be able to do it um, or to be specialized in it, I should say. Um, but general therapists can be very, very helpful and can do a lot of the things that I'm able to do once they know what non-epileptic stuff is and a little bit of a pathway on how to approach it. These two websites um, that I have listed here are the two that I would go to uh, to look for both referral options as well as recommendations for, um, you know, if you have, if you or your loved one already has a therapist, they can go to one of these websites as well and get a lot of information and education so that they can start the process of working on these symptoms as well. So while it is really nice if you get to see somebody who's a specialist, it's often very rare to find that or to be able to get in quickly with someone. And so this is a way that you can kind of help your loved one get into that, um, into the process of getting some treatment more quickly. Uh, next slide, please. Okay. We're gonna now talk in more detail about how to return to that functioning in everyday life. So next slide. So I think really important first steps are once the diagnosis is made, having an understanding of what's going on during the episodes and then return home, meaning like if you got this diagnosis in the hospital, you return home. Sometimes you can develop a plan for how to manage these symptoms before you even leave the clinic or before you even leave the hospital. But that isn't always the case. Um, if that hasn't happened for you or your loved one, then it's important to take stock now of what can we do to, to figure out how to react consistently to the symptoms and how can we teach other people what helps and what doesn't help with managing these symptoms. Sometimes the first step in, the, in that process is understanding from the physician that you've worked with, when do I need to be worried about this symptom? When do I need to come back to the hospital? Um, how do I approach it if the episode lasts for 30 minutes or an hour even? Uh, when should I move them like from the place that they are? Should I turn them on their side? All of these important questions. I can answer some of those right now because there's a pretty standard way we approach it. If these are non-epileptic and they've been diagnosed by a physician, very often, there is not a need to go back to the hospital or to the emergency room unless the person falls and injures themselves during an episode. More often, these episodes can go for long periods of time. They can go for 30 minutes. Sometimes they can go for an hour. And what's important is developing a plan with your physician for how to manage that when that happens. Now, there's a lot of stuff out there. Um, there's a lot of therapists and a lot of um, specialists out there, you'll see some of that on those websites that I just, that were on that prior page where you can go and actually find um, generic plans. Like um, we call them response plans where a person can kind of put in, this is what my symptoms look like. This is how I want you to respond to me when I have these symptoms. Um, more often in these situations, less is more. So uh, touching the person, turning them on their side, moving them around, doing a whole bunch of stuff is often not very helpful when these episodes occur. And um, unless they're in a situation where it's unsafe and they need to be moved so they don't fall into something or something doesn't roll on top of them or things like that. But more often, less is more. If they're in an episode, it's good to monitor them for safety, but not do a lot of manipulating. You're going to be able to find a lot of that information on one of those two websites that I listed on that prior page. And having a response plan is very, very helpful in being able to return to work, being able to return to school or like activities if there's a sport or something like that that a person is involved in. Um, because then everyone can respond to the symptoms really consistently. And if the person with the episodes knows that everyone around them is going to respond the same way and they know how to respond, then they're going to feel more reassured also being able to go into those environments. And so um, again, doing the response plan, writing that response plan with your physician 
is step one. And I think really, really important to do um, in order to help facilitate a little bit more of a return to normal. Um, another really important thing is for families, uh, whether it's an adult with these episodes or it's a young person with these episodes to be with their family and talk about how do we talk about this with other people? How do we talk about it with other family members? What do we tell people? Um, how do we ask them to respond if I'm with them when this happens? How do we talk with friends about it? Everybody has different levels of comfort in how much information they share. And I always tell people, it doesn't, you don't have to go into extensive detail about what it is. It's just important to tell people something so that they know that they can be reassured they don't need to call 911 when you have an episode. They don't need to um, do anything, you know, other specific things that are medical in nature that might be uncomfortable. It's helpful for people around the person with the episodes to know how to behave. And if as a family, everyone can talk about what feels comfortable to us, what do we wanna share before going back out into the world, that's a really helpful place to start as well. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, when a non-epileptic seizure starts, um, I will often encourage a person, if they have a little bit of awareness that an episode is going to start, uh, it could be, I feel shaky, my heart's starting to race, I'm feeling a little bit dizzy, it could be any of those things, it could be any number of things actually, there's a lot of different symptoms that people have, but if they notice something that happens before their episode starts, if they use some relaxation and distraction techniques that can often help to calm the episode, maybe not have as big of an episode or pull them out of it altogether. So that's the first step. Um, the do not give extra attention comes from everyone around the person having, who's having the episode. If everyone around the person gets very overwhelmed and has a very large reaction to the symptom, it will very likely cause that person to get really stressed and have an episode or have a bigger episode. So having the environment be quiet and kind of free of other distractions is helpful, although you don't have to change the environment drastically. It doesn't mean everything, all the lights go off, all the sound stops, everybody has to clear the room, none of that, but more like, um, if you're with the person who's about to have an episode, assist them to a quiet place in the corner of the room or in the corner of the couch, you know, maybe turn the volume down on the TV and let them have their symptoms. Don't do anything else. Um, it's the person who's experiencing the non-epileptic episode. They need to learn how to control it. And once they're able to, once they know some techniques from their therapy sessions, they will be able to develop some ways of starting to modify the way the symptoms happen. But people on the outside aren't able to do anything that's actually super helpful. So just making sure they're safe and letting them know that they're safe, that's the most important step. Um, again, we often encourage not to call 911 or call EMS unless the person is injured during an episode, like they fall and they hit their head or something like that. Now, if the person also has epileptic seizures, this complicates things significantly um, because it might, might be difficult for people to, for the person with the person who's having the episode to know, is this a non-epileptic or an epileptic seizure? Um, if there's ever any question, then of course you have to call 911. Um, and I often don't want people to feel like they need to make that call. So if there's ever a doubt, it's treated like it's an epileptic seizure. Um, but with the help of the physician involved, sometimes people can develop a really clear understanding of this is what the non-epileptic symptom looks like. This is what the epileptic seizure is. And then they can manage each appropriately. But the only way that to do that is with the assistance of the physician involved. Uh, next slide, please. Um, for young people, like we talked about, returning to school is often encouraged after the diagnosis. And this can be really, really challenging. Um, 
for a lot of different reasons. It's really hard to have these symptoms around other people. And it's really hard to have these symptoms around classmates. And especially if you don't feel like you can control them yet, going into a setting away from parents uh, and away from other safe people can be very overwhelming, both for the parents as well as the young people going back to school. Uh, this is why it is so important to have that response plan. And again, that's something that you can create with your physician um, or with the therapist involved with the aid of, of looking at some of those resources that I told you about online. Once the person does go back to school, it's really important for everyone who has interaction with that, that young person, like all the teachers, not all the students, but all the teachers and staff that that person might come in contact with, that they all have a copy of that response plan and they know how to use it so that if the person is in class and they, hey, I need to get out of class, I'm feeling kind of funny, I need to go to the nurse, whatever, that the, the staff knows what to do and they know they have a process in place for how to do it, that it isn't something that just like kind of randomly happens. Um, very often, uh, over time, as young people get better at being able to control these symptoms, they can actually stay in their classroom. They can actually develop skills often to be able to prevent going into a full big episode and can um, actually sometimes even manage their symptoms in the classroom without having to leave um, by just moving to a quiet part of the room or sitting in the back of the room. If they do need to leave and they need to go to either the nurse's office or a quiet room in the school, it's often helpful if they have um, somebody walk them there. It could be a friend, although I typically don't think this is a very good idea because it ends up just creating a lot of other problems and it puts a lot of responsibility on the friend. So I often like if, it, if there is somebody available in the school that can come meet that student and walk with them to the nurse or walk with them to the quiet room, um, that's much better usually. Um, and similar to what I was saying in the prior slide, um, decreasing stimulation, having the room be quiet and having the person practice the skills that they've learned in therapy to kind of calm their body can often calm the symptoms and potentially even prevent a lot of those symptoms from happening in school. Uh, next slide, please. Um, sometimes this can be, this can also happen in a work environment, but there are some really specific, you know, accommodations that can happen in a school setting rel relatively easily. Um, a 504 plan is um, a plan that can be put in place without too much evaluation by the part of the school, and it can allow for um, some modification to the student's day so that they are able to get out of the classroom when they need to, to use techniques to calm symptoms. Or if they have to miss a class, there might be some ways to make up the work or take tests in a quiet room or things like that that can cause, or that can allow the person to experience less stress at school. Um, one of the things that I often recommend is scheduled break times. So all of this information can be put into a 504 accommodation plan at school. And it, it can be um, something that doesn't require a lot of additional support from the staff um, other than just using that response plan again to get the student to a safe place when they need to. Now, in some situations, the episodes are either so disruptive or so disruptive to learning that an IEP, an individualized education plan could be recommended. Or in some cases, an aid um, like a, um, a person who could walk around with the student or help to manage the symptoms is necessary. Now, this is rare. This is not something that I recommend with every student at all, but that is a possibility. And sometimes when we have um, a single point person for that student who has symptoms at school, it helps to make it so that everyone else at school can relax and they don't have to um, manage that student in addition to their classroom it allows the, um, the student to have just this one-on-one -on -one person who can assist them. Usually when that has been necessary, that uh, when I've worked with other people who have needed an aid, it's been a relatively short process that they needed that. It wasn't something that lasted even a year. 
but um, it is something that can be sought if needed in order to get back into a school setting and have a consistent schedule in school. Um, next slide, please. Um, so I had mentioned in a, a few slides ago that having some having a way of describing this to other people is really important. Um, I often encourage people to develop some kind of a narrative about what the symptoms are, why they're happening, and tell people how to help in the situation if the symptoms happen. Most of the time, people are curious and a little bit confused. And when they see episodes happen, they can be worried for the person and maybe even sometimes frightened. But if they have information, if they have education about what to do, it reassures them, they feel like they're being helpful. And then often a lot of that initial kind of like, oh gosh, I don't know what to do. I'm, I'm worried I'm gonna stay away from this. A lot of that is um, calmed and goes away. So um, I always feel like educating people is the key, but it's important for everyone to feel comfortable with what information is given. So having that narrative, going through it with your family and thinking about what's appropriate to say and what would feel uncomfortable to say is really helpful before kind of getting back out into those settings. For young people, this is really tricky because um, they very often, especially teenagers, don't really want to draw attention to themselves, um, at least in these ways. <laughs> A lot of the time they like having attention, but not, not because of these types of symptoms. And so it can be really hard for them to figure out how do I explain this to other people? And often they will um, just clam up and I don't wanna tell anybody, I'm not gonna tell anybody anything about it. Um, but then if an episode happens you know, with their friends or an episode happens um, in a certain setting at school, um, it can start a lot of struggles, a lot of different struggles for them. So giving them, um, the ability to talk through what to say and coming up with a specific plan for how to say stuff. Typically with young people, I will suggest that they say like, oh yeah, I was just diagnosed with um, a type of seizure, good news. Um, I have a special doctor who's working with me on it. They think it's gonna go away. If you see me feeling weird or I say I'm feeling weird, here's some things you can do to help me. And then they can say that to you know their closest friends. Um, so then their friends know, okay, oh, she's getting, she or he is getting help. Uh, it's going to be okay. Here's how we can help them if they're not feeling well. And it just takes a lot of that mystery out of it and kind of calms it down. Um, next slide, please. So in summary, um, one of the things that I've sort of said over and over again is that it's really important for the for everybody to work together the medical team the therapy team and the person who has the episodes to figure out a plan to return to some normal activities um, creating a response plan is incredibly helpful and usually that response plan involves um, a description of what the episode looks like so that if somebody were to see it they would know what it is um, a little bit of information about what's, you know, what's happening or why this is happening. Very, very brief. And then a recommended way to respond so that, again, everybody is pretty consistently responding to this in a similar fashion. Um, if you don't get a response plan like this when you leave the office, the physician's office, I recommend that you ask for one. And if you can't find one, then you might find one on one of those websites. And for young people returning to school, you might need an IEP or a 504 plan, some type of accommodation plan to get back into those normal activities. Uh, next slide, please. So in conclusion, this is a pretty complex disorder. There's a lot of um, ins and outs with getting the treatment you need getting the diagnosis um, in the beginning and then getting the treatment you need and returning to normal life. Um, it's just really important to educate yourself and your family members. And um, again, that return to normal is one of the keys. Thanks everybody. Um, I'm happy to answer questions now.
so we can go to that final slide. And if people okay. have questions um, that I am not able to answer, you can also feel free to email me. Yeah, so we do have uh, a number of questions here and we uh, are sitting at 734 right now. So just want to make sure that we get to as many of these as we can. Um, Kim, I, I think you you answered this in general, but um, there's a specific part of this. Can people have epilepsy due to brain damage as well as PNES? Yes. Yeah. So um, it is not um it's be, just because you have one doesn't mean that you can't have the other i guess so yes people do have um non-epileptic seizures and they also can have an some type of epileptic seizure whether it's caused from um, brain damage or any of the other number of reasons that people develop epilepsy so yes yes are epileptic seizures caused and triggered by stress or just PNES? That's a really good question. That's a very complicated question, actually. <laughs> yes, they can be triggered by stress sometimes, although it's very rare. So um, there are certain types of seizures where if a person is experiencing more stress in their life, certain epileptic seizures, that they will be more prone to having their epileptic seizures if they are experiencing a period of really high stress in their life. So yes, that is something that can happen. But again, the way that you would know the difference between that is by having that evaluation and the physician would be able to see, you know, the epileptic seizures on the EEG. They'd see that abnormal brain activity where with the non-epileptic, it would not have that same abnormal brain activity. Yeah, great. Mm -hmm. um, this is more of a comment, but I, there may be a question in here. It's, I, it says, I'm taking both types of medication, one for non and epilepsy. Um, so I, I think you had just offhandedly mentioned that there are medications possibly for non-epileptic seizures that might be um, recommended. There, well, so there are not medications that are specific for non-epileptic seizures, but there are medicines that people will be given sometimes to treat the um, underlying, if there are other underlying psychiatric things, uh, diagnoses like anxiety or depression. So sometimes SSRIs like Zoloft is a common, or sertraline uh, is the generic name for Zoloft, um, is a commonly prescribed medication for anxiety or depression. And sometimes it will be given for people who have non-epileptic seizures as well. There are no, in my experience, and I'm not a psychiatrist, so I can't make recommendations or provide information about medicine in that way. But in my experience, non-epileptic seizures, and there has not been a medicine that I have seen that people get that manages those non-epileptic seizures and they go away. It's much more um, therapy with you know, managing and learning how to modify the body's response to these stressors, so. Okay. Great. Thanks. Um, this is an interesting one that I have not heard before. Have you had any experience with children who experience trauma in utero being diagnosed with PNES? Hmm. I have never myself worked with somebody where they felt like where it was felt that that was the trigger, if that makes sense. Um, it's entirely possible that there are people that I've worked with who have had trauma in utero, um, but I have actually never seen, I, I know for certain that there are no studies out there looking at that. Um, I've personally never worked with somebody who that has, where that link has been made, that it was that that caused the non-epileptic what I will say is that even for folks that I know or that I have worked with and, and in the studies as well, um, there's often not just one thing that causes non-epileptic seizures in that particular person. It's often a buildup of lots of different things that, that then end up resulting in um, the non-epileptic seizures happening. Um, so so it's often not just a single thing 
if that makes sense. Thank you. Yeah. Um, we've got someone who says they appreciate all of this wonderful information. Is there any peer-reviewed research done that has demonstrable evidence of patients who are female, late teens, early 20s with POTS and PNES? Mm -hmm. That's a good question. Um, there have been a number of... Um, I'm trying to... I'm like trying to think right now of recent research that's come out. I cannot think of a specific article that has looked at both of those things at the same time, which I think is the question. Um, does that occur? Yes, it does absolutely occur that people can have POTS, P-O-T-S, and PNES at the same time. Um, and in some individuals, um, people have been diagnosed with POTS, which is positional orthostatic tachycardic syndrome. So it's a cardiac, it's a cardiac condition who later went on and were diagnosed with PNES. So it showed up as POTS first, and then eventually the person began having PNES symptoms. What it was likely in those people and those folks conversion disorder the whole time. So like I was showing in that slide way at the beginning, how there are a lot of different functional syndromes. There are functional syndromes also in cardiology. I'm not saying that all POTS individuals are conversion disorder, have conversion disorder. But what I am saying is that it can show up looking like that in a, it can show up looking like a cardiac condition conversion disorder can show up looking like a cardiac dis condition, just like it shows up looking like epilepsy sometimes. So it, it can, um, I hope that answers the question. I don't know, that's a good question. And I don't know of an article that's looked at both things. Okay. Is this hereditary at all? Again, a really good question. Um, there is there is also no um, research out there looking at um, genetics and or even learned behavior in families. But I will say anecdotally from my own experience, I have seen it occur in families. So um, does that definitively say that it is hereditary? No, but that is definitely kind of a, a part of the field that's been understudied and one that I think a lot of people are very interested in and just has not been studied very thoroughly at all yet. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, and we have a lot more questions here and I'm afraid we're not gonna get to all of them tonight. Yeah. So I don't know um, if, you know, how we, I, I'd say we have at least one, two, three, probably seven or eight more questions. Yeah. Um, so it, it, would it be best for folks to, if, for those we don't get to, to email you with those questions? I'm happy to answer emails. Yeah. So if people would like to, um, I'm, ha I'm happy to kind of individually answer emails. Okay. Well, let's see if we can get at least one more in here. I want to try to find one that maybe um, hasn't really been addressed um, Well, it, do people become cured from PNES? We've got someone who has, this is something new for their child and they're mm -hmm. scared. Yeah, no, certainly, yeah. Um, yes, people can learn how to control these symptoms and they can go away completely. That isn't the case for everybody who has this but I have certainly seen many people where that has happened. Um, it's, it's often in the initial stages, really challenging to control. Um, but again, with treatment um, and depending on the age of the young person who has the episodes, within several months of treatment, typically they start to improve and can you know, put most of these symptoms behind them. Um, I have definitely myself worked with a number of people who have gone on to the symptoms 
completely go away and off they go to college. I mean, it's, it's definitely um, something that can be, I don't know that I like to use the word cured, but kind of go into remission. And, and I haven't seen it pop back up though with for, for those folks um, in those situations. So everybody's different. Everybody's reason for developing this is different. And that really does have an impact on, on course of, and prognosis. But certainly, yes, people can significantly improve and put most of these symptoms behind them. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm afraid that we are not going to be able to get to the rest of them. So I do encourage everyone to, you know, Dr. Das's, you, you will be getting copies of these um, slides. Dr. Das's email is in there. So I do want to encourage you to um, follow up if, you, if your question did not get answered tonight. Um, I do want to take a few minutes, just a minute here to um, remind everyone of EFMN's mission, which is to lead the fight to overcome challenges of living with epilepsy and to accelerate therapies to stop seizures, find cures, and save lives. I want to put in a plug for our information services. Um, if you have questions and some of these questions, you can also reach out to us on that and we may be able to answer some of them. Um, but really any questions having to do with epilepsy, if you need information, if you need referrals, we are here for that purpose. Um, we offer free one-on-one -on -one support and we customize our answers and, and the information we give you to whatever your situation is. So please reach out. Um, you can. There's a form on our website you can fill out and we will um, be happy to, to help you. This was our final um, Wellness Wednesday webinar of this year. We do want to invite you to our next Wellness Wednesday webinar, which will be held in 2023 on February 22nd. And the topic will be transition planning, which, you know, talking about moving from living with epilepsy as a child and moving into adulthood and what that means in terms both of medical care as well as life experiences and life planning. Our speaker will be Dr. Nicole Williams Dunan from Gillette Children's Specialty Healthcare. Um, so please be watching for details and registration that's not open yet on our website, but um, it, you, you will, as soon as we have it posted there, you will be able to register. Um, I do want to thank once again, Dr. Doss for providing such wonderful information and sharing her expertise. And I want to thank all of you for being here and, and um, you know, I answer asking such great questions and i hope that we will see you all again in 2023 have a wonderful holiday season and we will see you next year <laughs>